This is Roll Call for this edition of African Drums. The African drums are sounding. Good evening. Welcome to this week's edition of African Drums, the television organ of the Kofi 250 Committee, an organization dedicated to the empowerment of the African Guyanese community through education and the encouragement of self-activity. I am Elsie Harry, and I will be your host for this evening's program. As Guyana and the rest of the Anglophone prepare to commemorate another anniversary of independence of emancipation from slavery, as is customary, we engage in reflections of the meaning of emancipation and in the process, engage our historical memory of enslavement and its legacies. For young people in particular, slavery has to be put in its proper context in order to combat a growing intolerance for a history beyond the present. While we wear our African clothing and embrace our symbolic blackness, over the next few weeks, perhaps, it is time for a collective examination of our relationship to our history beyond our shadows. African Drums starts that process today by introducing our series, The Emancipation Story. Our first story addresses the period leading up to emancipation. In a sense, we examine the period from the 1823 Demerara Rebellion to the eventual emancipation on August 1st, 1838, to get a deeper understanding of the human involvement behind the struggle for freedom. To help us do that is Dr. Kimani Nehusi, university lecturer, public intellectual, and popular histori historian of the black experience. Dr. Nehusi, welcome to African Drums. Thank you very much, and thank you again. <laughs> You're having welcome. Me. You're most welcome. So the first question I'd like to ask you to get the conversation started is why should African Guyanese and Guyanese in general learn about the emancipation story? There are a number of reasons for this. And one of the most important thing is from the point of view of African Guyanese, it's something that happened to us. And it's a very, very important part of our past. And if we do not understand our own story, our past, so to speak, and especially the most important parts of it, then we won't know and understand ourselves. We place ourselves in a situation that's similar to maybe picking up a novel of 20 chapters and want to skip chapters or maybe begin reading from chapter 18 and expect to understand the entire thing. It's also important for all other Guyanese to understand this story because it's part of the story of Guyana. And for the same reasons, I would more or less in, um, argue that all Guyanese should know about what happened in this period. Okay, and would you say that the 1823 rebellion was the beginning of the end of slavery in Guyana? No, I wouldn't say that at all. I would say that the very nature of enslavement made certain that it was always on the books, that it was going to end, and that it was going to end primarily because of the resistance of enslaved Africans themselves. Um, it was a process, it took longer than maybe most Africans who were directly involved predicted and would have wanted. But the fact is that that was the most important aspect of enslavement and uh, of um, the end of enslavement. And even the way in which enslavement came about, the, the end of it came about, emancipation, so-called, um, speaks to this. There were other factors, but that was a major one. And is it true that slavery had become untenable? For the same reason that I mentioned just now. Yeah. 
um, that Africans were beginning to organize bigger and better revolts. These are crude words, bigger and better. But um, it was clear that the trajectory was moving towards what happened in 1763 in Burbies, when Africans led by Kofi um, put a revolutionary government in power for 11 months. Following that, between 1791 and 1804, Africans in Haiti liberated themselves and in the process defeated two armies sent by the French who were the world superpower at that point in time, defeated an army sent by the British who would become the world superpower replacing the French in a matter of a decade, defeat an army of Spanish and an army of local whites and mulattoes. This is a tremendous feat of arms that speaks towards the, the commitment of African people to be human. So Africans were making revolutions, were undertaking rebellions against the system on the basis that we are human beings and we would not stand this nonsense. And this made the end of enslavement inevitable. However, it is also true that economic forces began to move against enslavement. Along with the high cost of enslaving African people, that constant rebellion and subversion ensured, economic forces at large in Britain and in the rest of Europe made certain that the end of enslavement was more inevitable. Those economic forces began to show up in the sense that sugar and other products produced by a system of enslavement became too expensive and certainly significantly more expensive than commodities produced under a different system, so-called free system. Inside of that, remember that the new industrial class that arose in England, in particular, and later on in other European countries, who had an interest in selling manufactured items recognized in the colonies of Britain and later on in the rest of, the rest of Western Europe, a captive market to which they could sell those items very cheaply but in high volumes and make huge profits. Enslaved people are not people who you would normally associate a free market with, you know, spending money. They would get that money from wages through labor and so on. And this was another source of a nail in the coffin of the system of enslavement, physical enslavement. A third factor was the work of the people called the abolitionists in England. Um, these were humanitarian, but they weren't humanitarian, um, humanists. And they felt that for different reasons, including some of what I just mentioned, that it was an affront to human dignity to have other human beings in bondage. Most of them felt that Africans were inferior to them and uncivilized and the kind of racist nonsense that people peddle about Africans. Mm -hmm. But they still felt that the system was a bad one. Okay. So it's for these reasons, basically, that enslavement, physical enslavement, was brought to an end. Okay, and so in terms of resistance that the slaves, well, the enslaved, engaged in, can you walk us through what happened between 1823 and 1834? Yes. 1823 is a significant year because in that year, thousands of enslaved Africans on the lower East Coast Demerara, in fact, is East Coast Demerara, came out in rebellion against the system. Um, they weren't, the intention wasn't to overthrow the government. The intention was to force the government to recognize their freedom because they felt that Queen Victoria 
had granted them freedom and the governor Murray and his pals here were withholding that freedom. Of course, um, many people felt that it was time anyway to, um, for them to be free and they came out in revolt. Um, that was the biggest um, incident in the process that led towards abolition in 1834. However, one must remember that every day in the life of a plantation, enslaved Africans found ways of resisting the system. And therefore, when we talk about what happened between any two points, we must factor in this fact of constant resistance from the most innocuous thing like not working hard, being busy doing nothing, damaging tools, um, maining cattle, to um, verbal assaults on the masters and all kinds of different things that we know about, running away and so on. Africans were still doing those things, you know, so that was one of the things that happened. Also, we need to understand that even before 1823, the British, in their gradualist approach to things, had started on the pressure of various arts, some of which I mentioned before, had begun to relax the regime of enslavement. And there were some measures that were undertaken between 1823 and 18, um, 1834. Some things like Africans could work for wages under certain conditions and so on. But they, these were just small relaxations in the regime. Okay. Tell us about the reaction of the planters to this resistance and to the knowledge that slavery would end eventually. Planters, most of them, they weren't, um, you know, of one single mind on this. But the vast majority of them wanted enslavement to continue because they were convinced that they could continue to make huge profits um, under that regime. Part of the reason, I guess, why they were convinced of that was that they felt that the British military would always be able to put down revolts against the system. But what happened in 1791 scared them in ways that they had not been shaken before. And more and more of them began to look for ways out of um, physical enslavement. But even in Guyana, they developed an argument that said that if enslavement didn't continue, the country would be ruined. After the end of physical enslavement became a fact in 1834, many of them, well not really 1834, 1838, many of them started to say that if there was no immigration, the country would be ruined because they felt that Af the, the propaganda about Africans being lazy and not working and that kind of thing, that started to take hold. Okay, so before we continue the conversation, okay, Dr. Nehusi, Let's continue. <laughs> Slavery came to an end in 1834, but then there was a period of apprenticeship after. Can you tell us exactly what apprenticeship was and what was the real reason for apprenticeship? Apprenticeship contradicts the statement you introduced this part of the <laughs> yes. program by when you said that slavery came to an end. Yes. I have two objections to that. One is the terminology. Our ancestors were not slaves, they were enslaved, enslaved Africans. Yes. Enslaved Africans. And the second one is that the system did not really come to an end. Apprenticeship was a way of continuing forced labor. And there was no fundamental difference between apprenticeship and what transpired before apprenticeship. Um, planters were told that they had to pay African people if we worked over seven and a half hours per day. Um, but planters started to find ways of trying to subvert the system. One aspect of this apprenticeship 
that seemed um, um, a little um, advanced over the system of full enslavement, if I might distinguish these two by in that way, was that after working for seven and a half hours each day, Africans could do what they want, basically, and that if they worked any more, they were going to be paid for that. Well, planters found all kinds of ways of trying to subvert the small bit of freedom this offered African people. For example, some of them calculated, well, we're going to begin work at 7 o'clock, then you're going to work up to 11, then there's going to be a break between 11 and 1, mm -hmm. and then you're going to work the rest of the hours. This made certain that the entire day was occupied. Yes. Now, and that therefore Africans couldn't go, for example, to their farms, which normally was quite a distance away, and spend the time there working in their own interests, or that they couldn't go to adjoining plantations and work for wages there. So this, and in many other ways, planters started to undermine the intention of the system. And this shows the mindset of the planters. Yes. Can you tell us why apprenticeship was cut short? Well, it was cut short because it wasn't working. And the authorities realized that it wasn't working. I believe that the fact of that system raised tensions between Africans and enslavers so much that there was a very genuine fear among colonial authorities that there would be even more explosions than there were and that you know things could become really really serious so for that reason um, the system was cut short okay so we just spoke about how the planters used their special mechanisms to make sure that the enslaved Africans could not benefit from the little freedom that was to be afforded during apprenticeship. But how did the enslaved Africans make apprenticeship work for them still? I'm thinking here of the money that they earned and they eventually used to buy land. Well, that's, that's the, 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 the chief way or one of the chief ways in which they made apprenticeship work for them. It's a very visible way also um, that many Africans were able to earn wages during the time of apprenticeship because they worked over time and they saved wages. It's true that some of them had saved wages before, saved money from wages they, they earned before. But the fact is that this was a time of significant wage earning, especially when compared with what happened before. And this was one of the, the, the sources of money that Africans would use to buy land um, on abundant plantations and launch an alternative movement uh, for a society that was different from plantation society. We've become accustomed to seeing this movement only in terms of the village movement, which was its most important aspect, but it was not confined to the villages, to making free villages. Okay. About indentureship, would you say that it was a form of reparations for the planters? Yes. I think um, before we talk about indentureship and re as reparations, yes. We must recognize that when the physical aspect of enslavement ended in 1838, planters received heavy compensation of a monetary kind as reparations. The Africans who were injured, who were the ones injured under the system, received nothing, absolutely nothing. The system and the powers that controlled and made that system favored Europeans, the planters. They didn't have the interests of African people in their mind. And it's one of the things we need to understand about that system. So, immigration was started in the interest of the planters. It was their way of getting yet another set of compensation. And this is how it worked. 
immigrants, new laborers were brought in from Africa, from other parts of the Caribbean, from India, from Madeira and the Azores, from Malta, Germany, China, and a few other places. What is interesting about this are the following factors. One, the public so-called paid about two-thirds of the cost of that immigration, the immigration bill. Now, this is important because the public was really the African people. They're the ones who were taxed to pay for these immigrants. But what was the function of the immigrants? They were brought in to undercut the position of the Africans who were demanding just wages. So what the planters did was to depress the price of labor by bringing in more laborers under the indentureship system. This had a tremendously negative effect upon the lives and the life chances of African people. Secondly, consider this. Those new immigrants came from several different cultures and were of several different races. Planters were able to play upon these differences. The classic game, imperial game of divide and rule. Guyana is still suffering from that, the consequences of that today. So what planters did was to multiply as well as divide the labor force with the one, um, the one stroke, so to speak, of immigration. Planters would also use immigrants in very specific ways against each other and against African Guyanese. The way in which the Portuguese were facilitated off the estates and into the retail trade is a very, very well-known example. They were used as a buffer between um, Africans and the whites. The whites considered Portuguese as second-class whites or something like that, who were better than all the other uh, um, residents of the country. So they were facilitated into a middle-class status through the retail trade and allied businesses. However, we must realize that it was African Guyanese who started the retail trade, and the Portuguese were facilitated at the expense of African Guyanese. Mm -hmm. There were discriminatory measures enacted to ensure that African Guyanese were kept out of the retail trade and kept down, and Portuguese accelerated into the retail trade. For example, bankers wouldn't give loans to African Guyanese, or when they gave them, they gave those loans at very, very high costs and short time in which to repay them. On the other hand, they granted the Portuguese loans very readily at low interest over long periods to, replace, to, to repay. There are many other regulations, discriminatory regulations of the same sort. One of the things that happened during this period is that planters made certain that the taxation was shifted from indirect to direct so that m African people who, were, who bought certain articles were taxed very, very heavily. On the other hand, white people, estate authorities, got a articles that were imported at very, very low tax rates, or none at all sometimes. And there are other ways in which we could demonstrate that. There's another point that should be considered here. All the immigrants were subjected to immigration regulations. And immigration regulations really meant that these people were confined to the estates. They could not participate freely in the alternate society that African people were constructing at that point in time. Therefore, that along with the fact that they were compelled to work, albeit for wages, 
meant that African people were further undermined by immigration. We should be very careful to say, though, that the Indian people, Portuguese, and all the other people who were brought in as immigrants did not come consciously intending to undermine African Guyanese progress. In a land such as ours, where we hear all kinds of things, I think it's extremely important to point that out. All of these groups were manipulated in the interests of the European colonial authorities and their accomplices in the colonial project, in this case, the planters. It is true, though, that of all the groups brought, African people suffered the most, and African people continue to suffer. One part of the reason why we continue to suffer is that to this day, we do not understand very well what enslavement was, what transpired at the point in time we call emancipation, and how we must understand them. If you will permit me, I sure. will say a few words in that. Definitely. Too many people in this country, and Africans in particular, but not only Africans, believe that, as we put it, slavery ended in 1838. There's absolutely nothing that could be further from the truth. I objected to the term slavery before. And the reason for my objection is that when we articulate ourselves in the terminology of our enslavers, we are not free of the system erected by our enslavers. What I'm getting at here is completely consistent with something I said before, which is that the system of enslavement did not end in 1838. Enslavement was not only or merely a physical thing. It was mental also. Therefore, when physical enslavement ended in 1838, the system of enslavement persisted in the minds of many African Guyanese. What happened in 1834 may best be described as the legal termination of physical enslavement. The system of values, attitudes, and behavior patterns that had been forcibly inculcated by the institutions of society, the plantation, the church, the law, had not been ended in 1830, it persisted. And today, even at the level of language, and even is not a word that I should have used, the level of language shows how deeply ingrained these ways are still in us. We talk about good hair, meaning hair that is European in appearance. Yes. We talk about high complexion, meaning complexion that is lighter or nearer to Europeans. And we, we say a number of things very innocently, and in each one of these cases, we are actually making a comparison to forms, African forms, that are supposed to be very, very bad. So when we talk about good hair, the opposite to good hair with which we compare good hair is really bad hair, which is African hair. So African is bad. When we talk about good complexion, high complexion, and light complexion. The opposite is to be dark-skinned. Most African people are dark-skinned. And again, we're comparing Africa to Europe in a way that's unfavorable to mm -hmm. Africa. And it's not only that it's unfavorable to Africa, there is no logic 
behind this, no good logic behind this. You know, but it shows that we are still caught up in trying to become European, in trying to privilege Europe above Africa. And this is the chief ideological position of enslavers. Because enslavers could not enslave African people to the number that African people were enslaved and for the length of time that African people were enslaved by sheer physical force alone. They had to inculcate notions of inferiority in African people, inferiority of the South, as well as superiority of the Europeans. The church, the so-called Christian church, was a chief instrument of this. So the question of what happened in 1838 is not a question that's simply to be answered by saying that emancipation happened. And if we really want to think about emancipation, we'll have to recognize that emancipation is a project that African people started at the very moment the first one of us was terrorized and captured in Africa to be brought here to work for lashes instead of wages, as Eric Williams observed, on the plantations to build the shining cities of the damned in North America and Europe. And that therefore, we have got to continue that project. But we could only continue that project if we understand what transpired at that point in time and even before. What is the story? And the story is that the legal termination of physical enslavement in 1838 was a significant victory for African people. But it did not end the war that the Europeans started when they began enslaving us. 1838 took the chains off our bodies. We still have to take the chains off our minds. Okay. In the final analysis, what other lessons can African Guyanese learn from this emancipation story? There were mm -hmm. a lot of lessons just mentioned in what you just said, but what are the other lessons that you think African Guyanese can learn as they confront this moment of one of the greatest periods of struggle for Africans in history? Well, one of the greatest lessons, and I would argue that it must be the greatest one, is that African people must learn and practice at every single moment to see the world and everything in the world, including ourselves, from our own points of view. When we say words like slavery, when we say s enslavement or slavery ended in 1838, when we look at emancipation as something that happened only in 1838, we're looking at the world and seeing the world from the point of view of our oppressors and or we are announcing our own confusion about who we are and what condition we and the rest of the world is in or are in and therefore the most important thing we could do the most critical challenge facing us is to retake our minds, to rediscover ourselves, and see the world and ourselves as it really is, and as we really are. If we really wish to change reality, we have to begin by being willing to change ourselves. The new Africa and the new African we talk about the new world is not possible without a new African, without a new mindset, without 
people who really see their own their own conditions the truth about themselves and about the world whatsoever those truths are some of them may be embarrassing some of them may be frightening but we cannot contemplate real change unless we recognize and understand our reality whatsoever that reality is and I think that that's the fundamental lesson to be grasped from this whole question of emancipation of course you could talk about some of the things I mentioned just now emancipation is a project it's something that's always going to be ongoing because when we win one battle other forces come up to challenge us this is the nature of reality and in the notion of emancipation we therefore have a very important intellectual weapon for continuing to fight for greater and greater human liberation Thank you, Dr. Nehusi, for discussing the emancipation story with us. Myself and our viewers have a lot of food for thought, and this is only the beginning of our series on the emancipation story. So viewers, we want to thank you for staying with us, and please remember that on please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Coffee 250 for videos of the show, and please donate to the cause. You can send us an email at coffee250gy at gmail.com. I am Elsie Harry, and this has been African Drums, the television organ of the Kofi 250 Committee, an organization dedicated to the empowerment of the African Guyanese community through education and the encouragement of self-activity. Please join us next week. <laughs>